Well, welcome everyone. Um, it's three o'clock, uh, so we'll get started. Uh, very grateful to have so many people take time out of their day from all over the world uh, to be able to join us. Um, I've seen uh, everything from, from Massachusetts to Brazil to Russia to Nigeria to the West Coast. Uh, really great to have so many of you here. Uh, my name is Justin Reich. I'm on the faculty at MIT. I run a lab called the Teaching Systems Lab, where we study online learning and how schools and teachers use technology. Um, and uh, I study how teachers learn online. And we're incredibly grateful to have Marty West from Harvard with us. Uh, he's also the uh, Editor-in-Chief of Education Next, and he's a member of the Massachusetts Board of Education as well as the National Assessment Governing Board. Um, Marty, can we check one more time that your sound is working as we get started? Can you say hello to folks? Hello, it's great to be with you all. Terrific. Um, if you need to hop out in the middle of what we're doing, that's fine. You'll get a chance to get a recording of this afterwards. Um, and as we go along, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, and as we go along, uh, we'll, I have some colleagues who are going to try to keep track of those and, and help us be able to respond to them. Um, so let's see if I can get things going. Um, we in our lab recently released a report about remote learning guidance um, from the 50 state education agencies about uh, uh, remote learning during periods of school closure. Uh, we started this project on, Mass on March 25th. Uh, the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, released their guidance for schools and districts in Massachusetts. Uh, and when I saw that, I thought, oh, this is really interesting. Um, there are, and then I saw that Illinois had released some guidance at around the same time. And so I asked just about everybody in my lab to stop what they were doing for about a week between March 26th and the 31st and to try to read as much as we could of everything that every state in the United States was uh, was putting together to try to help schools and districts figure out um, what remote learning should look like across all these different contexts. Um, so on April 1st, we released this report, and I'll give you some highlights from that report, and, and everything that we'll talk about today uh, and from our lab is at tsl.mit.edu slash COVID-19. Um, and then we also took the data that we generated for this report, and we put it at the link you'll see there, um, bit.ly slash state ed COVID. Um, and again, we'll make sure that we get you the link to these slides and, uh, and everything else. So what we're going to talk about today is what we saw the states working on. Um, particularly up till about April 1st in helping schools and districts try to figure out uh, how to address the school closures which have now closed uh, nearly every school uh, in the United States and, uh, and, and many, many schools, maybe over a billion children out of school now all across the world. Um, so I'm going to try to talk about a few key themes over about 25 minutes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some background research that informed our thinking about this report. We'll identify some points of consensus that we saw over and over again across all 50 states. Um, we'll talk about some opportunities that we saw for a second wave of research, uh, of guidance uh, that, that might come out from states to help support educators. Um, and then we'll talk about the one area where we saw some kind of policy divergence um, and try to get at this question of what really is the purpose of schools during a pandemic. Um, I'll try to do that in about 25 minutes and then turn it over to Marty West uh, for about 10 minutes to uh, offer some challenges or some rebuttals or some questions or some predictions and his own thoughts. Um, during that time, we'll try to scoop up all the questions uh, that you ask um, and identify some of them to pursue during uh, Q&A. And we already have a couple of uh, coming in, which is, which is terrific. Um, so I want to start with sort of four ideas that have really shaped our thinking about this period of remote learning. And one of the most important is the existing research and the existing work of schools that are already operating at a distance in the United States. Um, many schools have some sort of virtual schools. And if you were to summarize their operations, they are primarily coached homeschools. So the schools that we already have that are operating at a distance, what they look like is they take curriculum materials and they put some of them on computers, but they print them out in books and workbooks and other kinds of printed things, and they mail them to families. And then for the most part, students with their families 
asynchronously make their way through those materials, um, checking in periodically with virtual school teachers for feedback, for some individual coaching, um, for some coaching not only of the student, but of the parent as well. Um, there is no expectation, particularly for the youngest students, that students should be able to do this by themselves. Uh, on the contrary, there's an expectation that there will be a full-time parent or caregiver, certainly through K-6, often through the eighth grade, um, for students, you know, who have challenges with motivation or executive function all the way through high school. There's an expectation that the way these virtual schools operate um, is that the school is providing support to the student and to the family for those students to be able to learn. Um, much of that happens asynchronously. In one survey, uh, virtual school teachers said they spend about six hours a week in synchronous instruction with classes of students and then really the best virtual school teachers uh, that I've talked to say that most of their time is spent reaching out individually to students and families especially those who are struggling especially those who are not showing up or not connecting and trying to bring them back in um, if you threw a dart at the United States in the middle of February and walked into the nearest classroom of where that dart landed on a map and you walked in that classroom, the most likely thing you would see is oral direct instruction from a teacher to a whole class of students. Um, what distance schools do looks very different from that. Um, it's, it's not the case in many places that we're shifting um, to have teachers now teach students at a distance, particularly for our youngest students we're asking our K-12 teachers to, at a distance, train parents to homeschool their children. Um, I was thinking today that it's a little bit like asking grocery stores to become greenhouses. Like it still has to do with food and there's still sun and there's still light and it's connected, but it's really a pretty different kind of thing. It's less different in high school, perhaps, where, it, where as soon as students become more independent, maybe it looks more like what happens at school. Um, but I think this coached homeschool model um, can give us some insights about uh, what it is that schools are trying to accomplish during periods of, of remote learning and school closure. Um, a second thing that's been going uh, in the back of our heads quite a bit um, is that many people find online schooling quite challenging. There was one community college educator who wrote a paper talking about an online penalty. Um, that uh, students who struggle in school in particular find it challenging to transition from on-campus learning to distance learning to online learning. Um, the students uh, who have low prior achievement in the United States, there's some studies that show that ethnic and racial minorities, um, students with low SES, younger students, um, find it challenging to move if informal courses from on-campus settings to online things. That there are some students, particularly those with high prior achievement, who do really well in school, um, who typically do fine online. There's some people, particularly those um, with really strong self-regulated learning skills and conditions that allow for self-regulated learning. Um, but one way that you could frame this um, is that all of the students that we expect to be hit hardest by a pandemic, um, to have the most issues with food insecurity, with housing insecurity, um, with healthcare issues, with the challenges of recession, those are the students in the best of times that we might expect would find it challenging to shift to online learning. Um, so those two ideas about virtual schools and about online schooling frame some of the challenging. Here are two things um, that I think give us some cause for optimism. Um, Lots of people, you know, this is a little bit paradoxical, lots of people do do quite well learning online. Um, most of you, I imagine, listening in on this conversation um, can think of a time that there was something that you really cared about and you were able to pick up your phone um, or hop in with a group or hop online and learn something about that topic and figure out how to uh, fix your lawnmower or to make a new recipe or to beat a level in a video game or something like that. Um, and there are researchers who have pursued teens and adolescents who uh, do this kind of interest-driven peer-connected learning. Um, Mimi Ito and colleagues at UC Irvine called it connected learning. Um, and they found that teens, even those who don't have great connections to the internet using mobile phones and things like that, can do incredible works um, of engineering, of writing, of computer programming, of art. Um, the, the fulcrum seems to be that when interest and motivation is high, online learning can provide all these resources and all these peer connections. Um, when interest and motivation is low, many people find it really difficult without the support of peers and of teachers to be able to press through. Um, so that duality is something that we've thought about uh, 
quite a bit. And then another thing which I think, you know, inspires us and makes us think that the work that educators around the world are doing right now is so incredibly important is the research on education in emergencies. Um, so from refugee crises, from other kinds of settings, um, there's some good suggestive evidence that schooling during emergencies can be a protective factor for uh, supporting youth resilience in crisis. Um, it can help create schedules and routines. It can provide intellectual stimulation. It can build connections with peers and trusted adults. Um, so the, the work that schools do, even when academic progress is really challenging, the work that schools do as a kind of bolstering of well-being can be very, very important. Um, so with those sort of four ideas in mind, we went and we read across uh, the state guidance from the 50 state education agencies, and we read through what kinds of things were they suggesting or instructing or coaching schools and districts to work on. Um, and we found lots of areas of consensus. Um, reading across all of these documents in many places we saw, people agreed about a lot of issues. Um, virtually every state, um, very clear, uh, that the health and well-being of students is a priority. As West Virginia said, feeding students is our number one priority. Um, virtually every state had commentary about equity being a central principle for organizing decision making, that we have to think about people who are food insecure, who are housing insecure, uh, people who don't have good connections to the internet, people who don't have access to devices, that these are key issues. Um, the uh, um, many states uh, posted some kind of encouragement that it's really important for educators to provide a free and appropriate public education for students with disabilities. In the United States, we have laws and regulations that make it clear that students with disabilities have a right to a free and appropriate public education. And an acknowledgement that this was going to be quite challenging to accomplish at a distance, but it had to be one of the goals that we considered to be central. Um, Many states were quite concerned about the digital divide, um, about limited access to devices and to, uh, and to broadband internet, and talking about the importance of creating non-digital remote options. Um, if there aren't enough devices or bandwidth in a household, how can we continue to support learning um, in these contexts? And then this was sort of a little bit harder to code for um, or, or, or to label or identify reliably, but certainly a strong theme of policy flexibility and what the Kansas State Department of Education and other Department of Education called GRACE, um, recognizing that these are extraordinary times um, and we need to provide policy flexibility to be able to um, to, to help folks address these issues. Um, I'm seeing that in the chat people are posting about the different kinds of ways uh, that schools and districts are addressing this theme. Billy Donegan saying um, Austin having 100 buses throughout underserved communities as Wi-Fi hubs and I would encourage you to keep posting those kinds of ideas and links to them um, as we go along because I think a lot of people will find great ideas along with questions uh, that way. Um, I want to dwell on two of these points of consensus. Um, one had to do with how should we provision non-digital remote learning? And I think there are three big categories of things that we saw. Um, one were packets. Uh, so printing worksheets, uh, putting them in envelopes. This is a picture from the Worcester Public Schools and trying to mail them or deliver them to every family in the district so that there's some kind of printed learning materials um, for people who may have uneven access to the internet. Um, a strength of packets and worksheets is that they're very familiar and people know what they are. Um, a limitation of them is I think many students and educators would describe them as kind of a low motivation, low engagement um, learning modality. Uh, pretty hard without the teacher and peers around you and some structure to, um, to, to make worksheets work. Not for everyone, but for a lot of students. Um, a second strategy that we saw emerging in a number of states, um, and I think we've seen more of this now, there was a recent article on this in the Washington Post, um, was partnerships with public broadcasting. So Arkansas stood out to us as a state doing a lot of really great things, but this was one of them. Um, they have partnered with public broadcasting so that there's 90 minute bands of public television programming. They do three through five, through grades three through five for 90 minutes. They do grades K through two for the next 90 minutes. They do programming related to grades six through eight the next 90 minutes. Um, so families that don't have access to the internet but do have a television know that there's a period of every day um, that they can take their kids, they can sit them down in front of the television, they can help their other kids at other grade levels um, with schoolwork or with homework, um, and, or they can get some things done or get a breather or those kinds of things. Um, there's lots of good research about the efficacy of our best educational programming. I personally think it's kind of a golden age of children's television programming 
doing right now. Um, and I think this is a strategy that can, that can help reach a lot of students in the United States. Um, a third theme that we saw was around family projects, around trying to ask the question, what are homes really well equipped to teach? Um, so I saw one article recently uh, that I was interviewed in from the Arctic Sounder, which is the newspaper of the North Slope of Alaska, uh, way, way up in, you know, if you think you're living in a disconnected area, this is a very disconnected part of the United States. Um, and the reporter said, talking to teachers, uh, she heard a lot of folks say, this is a good time to learn to cook, a good time to learn to bake, to sew, to bead, to repair a snow machine, um, to think about what, what are the, even as we have a hard time schools connecting with families, what are all the things that families can do at home? Um, because families, you know, homes are, are rich sites of learning, um, but often that learning can be different than school. So, so um, one thing you might do is if your uh, state or your school or district um, hasn't thought through these sets of ideas, um, we can point you particularly in the report to places that have some good examples of this kind of work. You know, not all these things need to be built from the ground up. Um, we, can, we can borrow and steal from our neighbors good ideas that are developing in one place and trying to spread them to others. That's really the core idea um, that, we hope the, uh, that we hope the report can, can support. Um, Flexibility and grace, a core theme, particularly around graduation and grading policies. Um, lots of policy guidance that schools and districts should do whatever they can to hold seniors harmless um, and to try to have as many of them be able to graduate either by waiving graduation requirements or modifying them, say a thing that we used to do with a state test, maybe you can do with a local test or a local demonstration of competency. Um, a number of different places thinking about grading policies, uh, thinking about um, what, uh, how might we use pass-fail grading, how might we use credit no credit grading, um, credit recovery, other kinds of approaches. Um, and a few states have started releasing guidance from their state higher education systems so that sophomores and juniors and seniors, 10, 11, 12th graders can know what kinds of expectations colleges will have from them and from their transcripts uh, during this period of time. Um, I think I'll pass on this one, just keep moving. One place that we saw an opportunity for sort of a second wave of guidance was around vulnerable populations. So in the United States, there are federal law and regulatory protections, both for students with disabilities and for English language learners. Um, we saw in the first wave of guidance, uh, more attention to students with disabilities and less attention to English language learners and particularly sort of examples and exemplars of approaches to make things accessible um, to, to English language learners. So states now are thinking about what's the next wave of work and support that we can do. I hope people will continue to dig in um, to, to creative ways that we can support vulnerable populations. Um, Mississippi had small bits of guidance about students in foster care and students in detention or incarcerated settings. Um, uh, Minnesota, I think, had some good language about connecting with tribal leaders in America's tribal reservations and thinking about schools that are on tribal lands and sort of jurisdictional partnerships there. Um, you know, I think some of the, some of the most vulnerable uh, students that we have in schools right now are students who are in incarcerated settings that can really be at risk of, of health concerns from COVID-19. Um, so I hope that if states don't have some of these considerations in their initial guidance, they can start scanning around, finding other states that are doing great things um, and sharing them and getting them out there. Uh, um, one other point that I wanted to make about vulnerable populations, I'll have to, oh, oh, that I think in, in this second wave of guidance, um, part of what I think educators would find valuable, this is a little bit editorializing, but the first wave of guidance, especially around students with disabilities, had sort of long lists of links to apps or resources that might potentially help make material more accessible. I think in the next wave of guidance, what a lot of educators would find helpful would be something like, here are the 10 most common things, challenges that we find with meeting students' individual education plans or meeting students' 504 plans. And here's how one creative educator or one creative district has come up with a pretty creative low-tech solution to solving that. Um, so I think sort of specific examples and exemplars of particular approaches and instances might be more helpful at this point. There are lots of lists of links to resources that are out there. Um, I think examples would be the next wave of things um, that, that would be helpful. Um, 
there was one area of policy divergence that we found. I wouldn't really say disagreement, just different perspectives for states. Um, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here, but I think it's a good opportunity to think about uh, potentially different approaches. Um, so some states looked at the fourth quarter where they knew they were going to be closed, and they said our goal is to make forward progress in standards-aligned curriculum. So here's some language from the Virginia Department of Education. Um, and Virginia said, look at what you usually teach in the last part of the year in America, schools typically end in, in late May or June, um, find the most important content in that material and try to make progress teaching that to students. And I think the underlying rationale there is the more students who can learn the more standards aligned material now, uh, the smaller the gaps will be in the fall. Um, and so there were a number of states uh, that we thought had guidance that was sort of aligned with this. Texas described it as making school at home, um, making forward progress and standards aligned materials. There were other states that took more of an enrichment, skills review, home-based learning kind of approach. Um, New Mexico was one state that released some early guidance that I thought clarified this approach well. And it basically says um, there are real limits to what we can do to bring school into home. Um, and, and there's a risk that if we try to make schooling happen at home, then we're as likely to generate frustration with students and teachers um, and parents as we are uh, progress and learning. So instead of trying to do school at home, let's try to think about what are the best kinds of learning experiences that homes are well equipped to support and use this time to do that. Um, uh, think about what it, you know, think about what it is that families are particularly well equipped uh, to teach and to help uh, support their students in doing and make that happen. Now, there was nothing that we read that was dogmatic about these two perspectives. So Massachusetts was a state that emphasized enrichment and skills review, but it also said, look, in a lot of high schools, it may be very appropriate if you can do it in equitable ways to keep moving forward with your courses. Um, and Virginia and its guidance says, we'll try to make forward progress. But if you're not, think about what you're missing and how you're going to make that up later. Um, Nebraska was one state which said, um, we think districts should consider starting with enrichment and then shifting more towards forward progress as things get more stable. Um, my hunch is, is that um, oftentimes in, in education, it's more important to get one system right than it is to pick the one right system. Um, so I would imagine uh, that what we'll see is some examples and exemplars of really successful approaches in states and schools that are aligned with either of these or combinations of them and probably some cautionary tales as well. But I think one thing that states can do is they're looking to other states for guidance is to say, who seems to be sort of aligned with our philosophy to, to, to how to approach remote learning and think about those states that we can form consortia with or borrow materials from or those kinds of things. Um, I think another thing that is evoked by this sort of divergence um, is uh, what is the purpose of schooling during a pandemic? Um, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? I hope that in all of the, you know, the flurry of activity that educators, teachers, support staff, schools, administrators, states are doing right now to make something happen, I think it's good to pause in that work and say, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? What is the purpose of schooling in a pandemic? And from our answers to that question, can we help gain alignment on what it is that we're trying to accomplish? Um, when I, on March 13th, I did an, we have a podcast that's called Teach Lab, and I did an interview with a great New York City teacher named Michael Pershan. And, and I said to Michael, who was one of the earliest teachers in the United States to pivot to, to distance learning, I said, Michael, I think you should really focus, you're not going to be able to do everything that you did before, so focus on the most important material. And he said, Justin, I think that's half right. Um, I think I should focus on things that are important, but I also have to figure out what is achievable at a distance. I think there are some things that we do in the mathematics curriculum that are really well aligned that I can imagine myself doing at a distance. And there are other things that seem much harder to do if I'm not right there with a whiteboard shoulder to shoulder with my students. Um, obviously, you know, so that makes me think of this kind of two by two, um, what's important and what's achievable. Um, obviously, things that are high importance, high achievable, those are desirable things that we really want to work on. Um, and in the middle, we have all these trade-offs where we've got to think about um, there may be some things that are really important to us, but are just hard to do uh, at a distance. Um, and we also want to be careful of potentially of things that are maybe easiest to do the difference, but not the things that are most closely aligned um, with our values. 
Uh, I think I'll pass on this too, so I can turn it over. Let me just say uh, a few final thoughts and then uh, turn it over to Marty. Um, we have some, uh, some guidance and some recommendations in the paper. Here's a slightly different twist on those things. Um, one is, I think there's a ton of great work happening in the United States, happening around the world, um, and I hope folks will borrow liberally uh, from those good ideas, particularly sort of concrete examples of the most common thorniest problems and clever solutions to those problems. Um, I hope that everyone tackling this challenge recognizes the constraints and challenges of home-based schooling, um, particularly this challenge of having K-12 teachers training parents to run homeschools during a pandemic. I mean, the more I sort of say that idea out loud to myself, it just strikes me as a really substantial challenge. It's certainly one that I think educators all across the United States, across the world are gonna step up and meet. But I think if we're realistic about what that challenge looks like, um, that'll help us meet it appropriately. Um, my penultimate story uh, will be that uh, when I was in college, I used to run a search and rescue group uh, in the state of Virginia called the Blue Ridge Mountain Rescue Group. And so uh, kids and, and elderly people with dementia would get lost in the woods and I would organize these teams to go find them. Um, and I learned about this system called the Incident Command System, which was developed in the American West to fight forest fires. Um, and one theme of the Incident Command System is that uh, when things become difficult, when emergencies arise, one of the first things to do is to assign a couple of people to think about and plan for the future. So in moments that feel like an all hands on deck kind of moment, it can often be good to design them as most hands on deck. So when we ran searches uh, and did search and rescue work, right when we got on scene, we would take two smart people and we would put them in the church basement and say, don't worry about what's going on right now. Imagine what this is gonna look like in 24 hours. Imagine what this is gonna look like in a week. Um, and I think that kind of medium to long-term planning now um, can, uh, it's, it seems like a, like a cost of resources, but I think it can pay dividends in the future. I, one of the things that I think would be helpful right now is to start to get some sort of straw men, sacrificial drafts of what should school look like when we get back? Um, what are a couple of models that are floating out there so that schools and districts and states can start gravitating towards a couple of those models and we can begin planning backwards and saying, okay, we know we want to emphasize this in the fall. So maybe actually we can do a little bit less of that right now or build toward that in creative way right now. Um, and then I would especially just say to our, to our colleagues, um, in state education agencies and the US Department of Education, um, be really vocal and public with the challenges that you're facing right now. Um, I think there are a lot of education researchers whose, uh, whose projects have been sidelined. Um, where, you know, people are busy with their kids and with other things, but I actually think there's a lot of bandwidth to take on uh, the thorniest challenges that are out there. Um, and so I hope folks will be, uh, will be really open about addressing them. Um, Good, so we've got some great questions uh, that I'll look through, but I'll turn it over to, to Marty for 10 minutes or whatever length of time he would like to be able to react and offer some, some questions or suggestions or challenge of his own. So, so thank you. Great, thank you, Justin, uh, for a fascinating presentation. It's certainly daunting to think of the challenges facing our school systems right now. Uh, as a discussant, my role is to offer my reaction uh, to the publication that we just heard presented. And I have two dominant reactions before I go on to share some thoughts of my own on the situation that we're facing. Uh, the first is my reaction as a researcher, and that's uh, one of awe at the sheer pace with which this report was put together. Uh, a week from the first publication of State Remote Learning Guidance to issuing this report. Justin, you may be too young as an academic yet to know that, but that's not how academic research is supposed to work. Uh, the second reaction that I have is more uh, in my capacity as a state school board member, and that's of extraordinary gratitude because this type of publication is exceptionally useful to us in real time right now, especially in uncertain times. And if these times are anything, it's uncertain. It's very helpful to have a sense of what others are doing. And that's the case even if we don't know right now exactly what the right way forward is. Uh, even when we don't have consensus best practices, it's useful to see what others are thinking about so that we can begin to think about what considerations we may be missing in our own state, what our blind spots are. So just an awe and gratitude that's uh, the, the, my dominant reactions. Um, let me take just a few minutes then to 
put the Massachusetts guidance on remote learning that was the focus of this report in context, because I think it's important to note that in Massachusetts, and I assume also in the other 50 states, that um, the guidance documents on remote learning that Justin and his team analyzed are really only one part of how state school systems are responding to the, the pandemic. So in Massachusetts, our governor announced the closure of schools on March 16th to be closed the morning of March 17th. Uh, and in the first several days after that closure, we as a State Department of Education supported districts, first of all, in setting up more than 1,200 feeding centers throughout the state in order to focus on the urgent need of keeping students who rely on schools uh, for their nutrition adequately nourished. We began issuing guidance on uh, urgent but less instructional topics like how and whether districts should continue to pay their hourly staff, even if they weren't directly involved in delivering instruction as would have been the case. We strongly recommended, clarified that they should continue to do that in part because of the economic role that we thought uh, school districts play in our communities. Um, and third, we put together a working group to begin gathering data and developing strategies to uh, uh, address the technology needs that we knew would come into play as soon as we began to get instruction up and running. So that was some of the preliminary work that led up to the issuance of the remote learning guidance uh, on March 26th. Um, that was issued in tandem with our governor's order that schools remain closed through May 4th. Um, in announcing that closure, the governor set the tone by emphasizing this, this was uh, not a vacation, that we expected learning to continue. But I think it is important to note that the assumption at the time when we were drafting that guidance was uh, that there would be a closure for a month. And uh, we weren't necessarily planning on the closure lasting beyond May 4th. And I think I'm gonna return back to that in a moment because I think it uh, helps explain some of the decisions that we made. Um, so uh, we were proud in Massachusetts, we made it a priority to actually engage stakeholders in developing the remote learning guidance. Uh, so uh, ours was issued not just by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, but with sign off from the Superintendents Association, the school committees, the teachers unions, the PTA, the Charter Schools Association. And so we thought it was important that the entire education community in the state speak with one voice. Uh, we made it clear that what we were offering was a set of recommendations, not requirements. That, of course, is consistent with the strong tradition of local control that we have in Massachusetts uh, that many states also share. And then the third thing we wanted to make clear right away is that remote learning is not synonymous with online learning. This is something that Justin touched upon in his remarks, uh, but we thought was critically important given uh, some of the technology barriers in some urban communities in particular, uh, but also concerns about uh, the role of screen time and its potential consequences. So what we, we did recommend uh, was that school districts offer family structured schedules that lasted approximately half the regular school day. Um, uh, we acknowledge that uh, schools would have to make different decisions based on circumstances about the right approach to grading. But we did say that educators should make contact with students multiple times per week, uh, that students, even if assignments weren't graded in a traditional uh, way, should be receiving feedback on them. And uh, Justin highlighted this as, I think, the uh, one area of divergence, he said, uh, across the states. Massachusetts was a state that initially at least recommended a focus on review of prior concepts uh, and enrichment going deeper uh, in applying them as opposed to the introduction of new content. So we recommended that would be the focus, but I don't wanna overdo this divide between the two approaches. I think it's right that you see states making different decisions with respect to the emphasis, but if you look at what we said in Massachusetts, we immediately made exceptions uh, and noted that in particular at the high school level that it may be important to continue to introduce new concepts. Um, and uh, 
I think um, another thing that's important to keep in mind uh, was that this guidance was again based on the premise of a closure through May 4th. And uh, as we begin to contemplate what seems like the likely prospect of a longer closure, uh, we're thinking about a, a change in that approach. But the approach initially was based on, yes, equity considerations, Want to be sure, be, wanting to make sure that if we were introducing new content, everyone would be able to access it. But also this more pragmatic question of what could be done in short order. Uh, and I really like Justin's framework of what's achievable and important. And so it was as much that consideration as the equity consideration uh, that, that led to that initial emphasis. So um, that's a bit about the guidance. Uh, how about what comes next? Well, uh, as I just suggested, we do expect to be updating this guidance uh, most likely in the next week. Uh, we, uh, in one of the ways Justin suggested would be uh, useful, plan to be offering much more in the way of concrete examples of uh, successful approaches to challenges in areas like special education, but also uh, more broadly. And as I just suggested, we are going to recommend uh, a um, that schools start to introduce some uh, new content with a focus on foundational standards, power standards, as we refer to them in the state uh, sometimes, as well as standards where we think that would be uh, reasonable to be delivered at a distance. Um, but even more important than updating the guidance, because I think uh, we are clear eyed about the fact that even if we and all of our school districts do uh, as good a job as possible as resp of responding in real time to this situation, that uh, there are gonna be serious uh, losses in learning for students in Massachusetts. And we need to be planning right now to begin remediating those. Uh, so that's thinking about the summer and re-entry planning if, as we all hope, schools are able to reopen in the fall. Uh, we're just starting that process, but I think the foundation of it has to be a diagnostic assessment. So we, like other states, canceled our spring assessment. Uh, I'm hoping we can repurpose those resources and efforts in a different form of assessment in the fall, focused much more than the state test traditionally has on diagnosing individual weaknesses. Uh, I think that will allow us to do much more in the way of ability grouping, uh, so that we can really deal with what will be unprecedented heterogeneity in students' preparation to engage with grade level content. Uh, we need to be thinking about ways to make up instructional time, whether through summer school, if the health conditions allow that, or by extending school days in the fall. Uh, there are some federal stimulus funds that uh, are coming down very flexibly uh, and may be used for that purpose. Um, I think we need to be thinking about uh, creative ways of staffing to be able to uh, reduce class size, perhaps even to engage in uh, tutoring. Um, uh, the likely state of the economy uh, may mean that uh, there's some talent available that school districts can draw on in non-traditional ways, and we need to make sure that they have the flexibility in order to do that. And then finally, unfortunately, we need to make sure that school districts do have a seamless plan for any closures that may occur over the course of the 2020-21 academic year. I think uh, most projections at this point suggest that uh, such closure, closures on a rolling basis in response to health conditions in particular communities are uh, uh, very difficult to rule out uh, and we need to make sure that we're prepared when that happens. But as I think about the planning for next year, with the exception of that last item of being prepared for closures, all of the other uh, priorities are really low tech. So while uh, technology, uh, remote learning may be the uh, topic of the moment, I actually think it's sort of in the spirit of getting back to basics that we need to prepare for the fall. So um, those are my thoughts in response to what I think is a extraordinarily useful report. And I will, uh, stop now and hope that we can engage in a bit of conversation.
Sure. Terrific, Marty. Well, thank you so much for sharing some of that uh, background perspective from one state uh, to, to talk us through the process of what the thinking looked like to get to that initial guidance. Um, and I think, you know, a thing that you emphasize that's really important is that we captured what states were doing in our report at like a particular time at a particular snapshot. Um, and uh, we didn't capture everything that states were doing. So states may have been sending home guidance um, through teleconferences with their superintendents that weren't recorded or through emails or other kinds of things. Um, so uh, um, we, we got one snapshot to try to sort of highlight some, some key themes. Um, one question uh, that we had was about sort of either national or more state level consistency. So Massachusetts is a state with a strong tradition of local control. One person said, you know, how much consideration is there for formalizing distance learning requirement? I have two sons. One of them has to spend six hours a day in front of a computer for classes while the other checks in with a teacher once a week. Um, one of the things that struck me uh, is that, you know, there, there are times when we encourage um, sort of flexibility and diversity and approaches to teaching and learning. We say, um, let's hold schools to similar standards of accountability, but let's let them get there in different kinds of ways. This seems to me sort of a particularly a moment um, where I heard, uh, you know, state leaders, district leaders saying, actually, we would like some guidance right now um, so that we don't get too far, so, so we don't get too far out of step with our neighbors just for one reason. You know, that was one of the things that I thought was useful about uh, Massachusetts and many other states offering some time-based guidance. You know, there are a number of states that said, um, uh, let's organize about half a day of schooling. That actually aligns with, I think, the research on homeschooling and virtual schooling. That's about as many hours as many homeschool families uh, do uh, at, the, at the oldest level. Um, it struck me that actually in many of the sample schedules that we saw, um, many of them include, in, even if there's only three hours, they include time for exercise and physical education um, and creative expression every day. Um, and Massachusetts had similar guidance, uh, but many other states did as well. There are some great examples in the report um, from the San Antonio Independent School District um, that, uh, that gave some ideas about exercise and the arts every day, which seemed like um, they would be really valuable for young people in the midst of a pandemic and, and, uh, and possible for them to do at home. Um, you know, I guess as you think about the fall, um, how important do you think it is for there to be this sort of continued push for more consistency um, versus letting schools kind of figure out uh, what it is that they uh, that they want to do to address these challenges? Yeah, it's it's a um, it's a it's a difficult question uh, because uh, as I suggested, I don't think we know uh, based on research the one right way to advise schools to respond right now. Uh, and so part of me wants to say, as a result of that uncertainty, that uh, experimentation is what we want to encourage. At the same time, I think you're absolutely right that there is a strong desire from the field uh, for guidance because of the, that same uncertainty. Uh, and I think that's why you've seen some convergence across states as states look at what uh, each of them is, is, uh, is saying. So I think uh, the right compromise is to uh, lay out some principles uh, on things like the amount of time that should be expected, uh, the fact that there uh, should be some uh, interaction, uh, presumably some modicum of synchronous interaction between individual students and teachers. Uh, my understanding of the research on uh, online uh, schools suggests that that is associated with more effectiveness, even if we don't know what exactly the right amount is. Um, uh, so I think uh, what we've tried to do is articulate some principles along those lines while then acknowledging the fact that there is gonna be a uh, need and there's value in allowing experimentation variation at the local level. And hopefully we can, as I suggested, we're trying to do right now, surface uh, some promising examples uh, that are emerging from the field. 
Great. You know, I, I mean, I, I very much agree with you that we need to be thinking creatively about how we use time and resources uh, in the in the fall. Um, I, I had actually suggested uh, at one point with some others that, that I hope that the federal government sort of includes additional stimulus funding to make it more possible for states to hire teachers. I had been hopeful that that could happen starting in the summer, um, but certainly for extended time in the fall. Um, uh, Kathy Siebold uh, makes a comment that, uh, you know, just adding time on the end of the day of the fall without quality won't make up for lost learning. It'll only add time. Um, I had been talking with some other Massachusetts educators who said, uh, it's not clear that we need more time of uh, children, you know, having instructional time, but actually if we had more time um, for collaboration, for working together, for looking through whatever kinds of diagnostic assessments we try, try to do, um, that that could be really valuable as well. Um, another concern I have um, is that I, uh, as people think about reallocating time and critical standards, I mean, there's a lot of lost learning right now. I, I would be concerned that if schools pivot too hard in the fall to just replacing that lost learning, um, that what'll be cut is all the things that kids love most about school. Um, like, like if we say, oh, we, you know, we missed a lot of these power standards, you know, now some of the power standards are things that kids love. Um, but if we were to say, well, let's put a pause on physical education and music and the arts and extracurricular activities and really focus on reading math, we might find that we have more hours of those things, but not necessarily more effective engagement um, with students in schools. And, and certainly schools will do that with sort of varying levels of quality. Um, but that to me seems like the kind of thing that, that some of what these uh, uh, you know, plans for the fall might need to address. I mean, I also think uh, Natasha sort of mentions this, that there's just gonna be, if, if, if the first time kids really do get back together is in schools in the fall, there's gonna be this sort of bottled up demand for social connection. Like part of what kids are just wanna do, especially teenagers I think right now, is spend a lot of time you know, saying, oh my God, what did you do during all of that? You know, and they're and a totally natural sort of aching to, to be connected. So I think that's something that, that, uh, that student, you know, the teachers are gonna, school systems are gonna have to balance um, the sort of uh, the, the, the national trauma of a pandemic and recession um, combined with this really exciting, you know, hopefully reunion with some some learning times that are missing, um, and then also a need to make sure that that all the things that make kids love school are still there, um, so that that they're excited to come back. Yeah, I think part of that, Justin, is why I think additional time is going to be needed. So I, I agree with the concerns in the comments that look, additional time if not used well isn't going to do anything, but uh, you know, it, it, simple projections based on just the amount of time students are learning, uh, based on the rate of learning growth across the year, suggest that we're going to be 30% uh, of a year, 50% of a year, depending on the study you look at behind where we otherwise would be. And yes, those other functions that schools play are so important. And one of the things that's coming out of this is, I think, a greater recognition on the part of society of the custodial function that schools play, the social function that they play in our communities. And so we are not going to want to ignore that, but there is time that needs to be made up. So we need to be thinking creatively. In Massachusetts, one of the things that our commissioner did when he was the state appointed uh, superintendent in uh, Lawrence Public Schools, uh, he used school vacations to uh, bring together the most effective teachers in the state uh, with the students who are furthest behind based on diagnostic assessments to have a very intensive uh, focus on uh, core academic subjects. These are known as acceleration academies. Uh, well documented that um, uh, that, that was a, a driver of improvements uh, in that district. So that's an example of uh, a creative way we can find to um, to, to find additional time for those students who need it most. Yeah, I think those concrete examples, you know, I mean, it's, it seems like it's a, especially a concrete example that came during a challenging period um, it are, are things that we can turn to. Um, Michelle Bailey uh, 
points out that the uh, additional time will be costly, especially during a time of reduced state funding. I think those of us that care about education, that see the incredible value of schools in their custodial pastoral function, that see that how an extended school day could conceivably help America get back on its feet, both by putting more people to work in schools and by giving parents more time to look for work, to pick up shifts outside of school. Um, I hope lots of educators will consider uh, advocating for that. Um, Raul Boken um, asked the question, you know, who should be part of the conversation about the planning section? Um, who should be involved in planning conversations? Um, and I think as in some places things stabilize, there's, there's lots of opportunities for people to get involved in that. I think there's a real role for students to play involved in that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I told my colleagues at MIT um, is, one of the first things that we should do uh, as we transition to remote learning, although I was on teaching leave, so I, I did not teach in MIT this semester, um, is think about how we partner with students. Um, one of my favorite educators is a guy named Kurt Hahn, uh, who founded Outward Bound. Um, and he has a quote, which is something along the lines of, look, there are three ways to engage the young. Um, there's persuasion, and that is a hook without a worm. There's compulsion, and that is of the devil. Or you can tell them you are needed and that hardly ever fails. Um, it's so often the case you know, in our daily lives right now that the coronavirus, the closures, the pandemic, they feel like something that are being done to us. Um, and one of the things that we can do as educators is to have our response be something that we build together. Um, so I've certainly been encouraging educators at all levels to keep asking people even simple questions. How is this going for you? What's working? What could be different? To have teachers ask those questions of students. I think if uh, administrators, school leaders, uh, state officials ask those questions of principals and superintendents, then that'll give them the cue to, to do that. But I think, um, I think it'd be really exciting to have groups of students working with faculty, um, working with educational experts, school leaders, um, be able to start mapping out. Uh, here are a couple of different visions of what the fall could look like. I think it'd be fun to have people from different sort of positions in the education system say like, what should the first day of school look like? What should the first week of school hmm. look like? What will really get us in a very concrete way sort of ramped up um, into, the, into the future? Um, Marty, I would, here, a question that I had for you was, what do you think are some of the most compelling unknowns or research questions right now uh, that we could potentially answer? Um, what, are, what, are, what are some things, you know, so, so, in, so in our lab, a ton of our research is done in partnerships with schools, and that's just not happening right now. You know, we've been doing all kinds of innovative education technology things with math teachers in Boston, and now we're just trying to help them do remote learning, and our research is kind of um, uh, shaved down. What... Um, what kinds of questions do you wish that people spent uh, the next three or four months between between now and the beginning of the year answering? Man, it's 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 tricky because I think uh, you know obviously um, uh, you want to learn about the relative efficacy of different approaches to remote learning right now, uh, but in doing that, you uh, hope that we'll never be in a position to have to draw on that uh, that evidence. Uh, again. Um, uh, but I do think we need to find ways to document uh, what it is that uh, families are experiencing so we can begin to ask those questions um, about the uh, efficacy of different approaches. Um, uh, so I think um, that's where some of my team's efforts right now uh, are going into trying to put together nationally representative surveys of, of uh, families to see how what is going on uh, varies from place to place. Um, uh, I, I guess I'd be interested in your reaction, Justin. I, I, I certainly agree that description is the first step, just like concretely what is happening right now in families and with teachers. I mean, one of the, one of the uh, phrase that keeps coming to mind, I think often does as education researchers is the idea that education systems are loosely coupled. Um, so what states say should happen, what schools or districts say should happen, yes. may or may not at all be what is happening on the ground. Um, and so just knowing uh, what people are up to is uh, one great starting point. Um, I do think that if we can find some points of divergence, um, we could say, you know, like I, I wonder, I, I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to be able to answer a question um, 
you know, for to what, when, when states really try, in, in places where they really tried to make forward progress on standards around curriculum, how much of that was actually able to happen? Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, how much of it was able to happen not just to affluent, well, internet connected students, um, but really to the full swath of students? Because that could get, you know, if we can say, look, in the places that the, this, this, and this, they, yeah. they actually make some good progress. I mean, I, I also think that we could have some places that said, there are some places that tried to make forward progress against standards in math, and there are other places that had their kids mostly watch Peg Plus Cat and Odd Squad. Um, and Peg Plus Cat and Odd Squad were designed to support independent at-home learning. And so even though they weren't on target, they still you know, worked better for net learning, you know, net, net maintenance of learning, net mm -hmm. learning against standards than other things did. Um, I mean, as, as somewhat, you know, um, as, as someone who spent a bunch of my career studying education technology, my experience is just teachers are successful at implementing it when they have a lot of runway to get better at it. Um, you know, and so, and, and I, I fully expect there'll be some uh, educators who do amazing, amazing things in all kinds of circumstances now. But I do think that if we knew something about what was working or not working as well right now, um, we are going to have, um, uh, waves of school closures next year. That seems inevitable to me. I hope it's not all of next yeah. year. Um, but, uh, you know, especially in urban areas, uh, you know, potentially in rural areas with less healthcare where they can do less contact tracing or other kinds of things like that. So having some sense of what works, uh, what, you know, or, or e I mean, even what works locally um, would be helpful. Um, what are some, uh, did you have a thought on that, Marty? No, I, I, uh, I, I think that's right. Uh, I just think uh, as important will be um, what we learn from differing approaches to uh, remediation and reentry or remediation upon reentry. Yeah. Uh, because um, I, I do think, uh, you know, uh, one of the things uh, we're realizing is that um, the, the shift to full on ed tech uh, it, that, because of this recognition of the other roles that schools play, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's the near future. So, um, yep. So uh, what can, what can we do in yep. those local environments? Yeah. Um, you know, some of the questions that we get uh, when students choose not to engage in remote learning opportunities for a variety of, of reasons, uh, connectivity, devices, home environment, caretaking, student comprehension, um, how are folks issuing grades doing so through the lens of equity? Um, you know, I mean, as someone who, who sits in a college with a lot of undergraduates, I've been thinking about this a lot because um, what we use grades for in our admission is to get, get a sense of who would be successful at MIT. And someone's performance in the midst of a pandemic pandemic doesn't necessarily let us make good inferences about how they would perform during normal times. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I absolutely agree with something that you said before, which is just the incredible importance of feedback during this period. Um, when we make contact, when, when students make contact with educators, that can be powerfully motivating for students. When we know how we're doing, how we're learning and how we're growing, that can make a difference. Um, I think we're seeing some really neat models emerge um, in, uh, in places like, I think it's Phoenix, Arizona, um, where they've recruited their entire uh, district staff to try to make sure that someone touches base with all 28,000 kids every day. Um, Matt, uh, MIT actually did something very similar. Um, we, we took in a bunch of volunteers to be student success coaches. And we said, um, you know, in a lot of our classes, we have, we have 400 students and one instructor, even if they have been instructional teams. Let's try to get everyone who's involved in the system to be able to help us connect with students um, because that's certainly one of the things that I heard from really great virtual school teachers is that a huge amount of their time is spent reaching out um, and connecting to people um, and so uh, um, I think feedback is incredibly important I think grades seem like a, a thornier issue it seems like to some extent one of the main things we use grades for is for college enrollment and admissions. And I'm seeing, I don't know if you're seeing the same thing, but I saw the University of New Hampshire, the University of California, Berkeley say, look, we're going to expect pass fail grades on transcripts. Yeah. Um, I actually would love to see colleges very explicitly say we're adding a question or repurposing one of our questions to say, what did you do during your time um, in the pandemic to take care of yourself mm -hmm. and to take care of others? Um, 
Um, I, be, because I think there might be, I think, I, I mean, uh, I got an email from um, somebody who was dealing with one of our undergraduates who said, hey, look, I'm actually just going to uh, fail or mostly drop out of my um, comparative media studies classes this semester because I need to homeschool my two younger siblings who are working. Um, and, uh, you know, it's those kinds of sacrifices that I hope people think and attend to. Um, I would love to see our older high school age students, um, you know, really play a role, uh, you know, Massachusetts is organizing this huge network of voluntary or, or uh, um, entry level contact tracers. Um, you know, high school students might be great people to be involved um, in that kind of work. Yeah, I think this, uh, I, so it is the case that we have encouraged uh, districts to avoid uh, not awarding credit uh, for students who disengage um, unless uh, it's sort of a, a last resort while also acknowledging that we don't have the information to, to figure out exactly uh, how best to do that. And I really like your idea, by the way, of, uh, of building uh, a question into the college admissions process uh, in light of that. I'm, I'm confident though that, uh, that higher ed institutions will, um, will recognize that this is a un unusual time. Um, I, uh, so I, I think um, I, I just want to respond a little bit to uh, some uh, comments in the in the chat that I'm seeing uh, on the role that equity considerations, which, uh, as you say, have been front and central uh, in how states are thinking of responding here, um, uh, can maybe sometimes act on a as a break on innovation or, or moving forward. And sometimes they are cited uh, in questions of, for example, the degree to which we should be moving students forward versus reviewing. Um, but I think uh, it's, uh, again, it's a mixture of those equity considerations and pragmatic considerations uh, that I think for, for me is, is driving some of these decisions. Yeah, um, I think, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that my colleague Tressie McMillan Cottom said around issues of equity is that the thing that schools have to make a world a more equitable place is school. Um, that is the primary tool we have, and that's been taken away now. I mean, I actually think when people think through these issues from an equity lens, um, they often look at something and say, well, this thing, it's not going to be equitable if we do it that way. I, mean, I think in a lot of cases, the other side also is not going to be uh, equitable that way. Um, and, uh, and that's why I think the emphasis on how do we think about, um, you know, everything that we can do in the fall um, to bring people bring people back together. Well, it's four o'clock um, and there are lots and lots of questions here that we, uh, hopefully we got to themes of all of them. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll hang around uh, and, uh, and stay for a little bit and see if there are any other urgent questions that uh, came up, but I wanna let people get on to the rest of their day or people can, can reach me uh, on Twitter or by email at, at BJFR. Um, in our lab, the Teaching Systems Lab, we're putting all of our materials up at tsl.mit.edu slash COVID-19. Um, we'll have a recording of this that's up on the Teach Lab podcast, um, as well as other programming that's about COVID-19. Um, Education Next, the journal that Marty edits, has a lot of great, and very provocative writing, um, and they've got a page there that's devoted to, to COVID-19. If you go to educationnext.org, um, very, very easy to find. Um, you'll all get a recording of the webinar by email. Um, and, uh, and Marty, thanks so much for taking some time out. Thanks to everybody who, who joined us to, to share their ideas uh, and opinion. And really to all the educators who are trying to make this work, I think, I think those of us who are trying to make advice, we're not trying to second guess what people are doing. Um, they're, you know, my hat is off and my heart is with all the educators who are, who are trying to make this work right now. And I'm really grateful to all of you from Massachusetts, from the US, from around the world, um, who, are, who are taking some time to think with us and talk with us about how we can we can do this best to, to serve kids. Amen to that. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to participate, Justin. Terrific. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, if you have any uh, uh, last follow-up questions, uh, feel free to bring them, and I'll try to do a little typing to respond or, or hit me up at Twitter at, 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 at BJFR, and Marty is at Professor Marty West. Um, but otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll pause the recording and, and let everybody go. So thank you all so much. <laughs>